Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now today's video is the little known battles of the war of the Breton succession. I've chosen three battles. There are so many of these minor skirmishes. I haven't even got to the sieges yet. So we're going to have a look at these three battles, uh, Luna Long, Moron and Ore. Each one is important because it shows how the French are trying their hardest to counter this English system, the bowmen on the flanks, the men at arms in the center and fighting on foot. Now the war of the Breton succession, a bit complicated. It's under the umbrella, if you like, of the Hundred Years' War. Now, if you want to know more about it, find my uh, video, my film on the Battle of Morlaix. It's in the playlist because that tells you all about who the different players were, the causes of this war of the Breton succession. But now let's get on to these little known battles, shall we? So the first battle I thought I'd tell you about is the Battle of Luna Long. It's just southwest of the old battlefield of Poitiers, so we're right out in Western France. Now, the commanders of the French Breton force was Jean de Lille, and he's the Seneschal of Poitou. Seneschal um, assists the nobleman like a mayor or a sheriff, something like that. He has 1,500 men, local, they're all mounted, and the enemy for them is going to be the Anglo-Breton force, 500 men under Thomas Coke. It's kind of an interesting battle because it reflects something that I think the English have learned from the Scots, thank you Scotland, and something the French were trying out. But first of all, the battle didn't just happen. What was going on it was there was a Breton-English garrison at Lusignan a fortress and the uh, French were going to attack it and there was a relieving force sent from Bordeaux under Thomas Coke, only 500 men, as I said, and these were the men who were actually intercepted at Luna Long. And this is basically what happened. Now, it's, it's quite difficult because I, I read about these, and each time it says, you know, we don't know very much about this, and we're not sure about that. So this is what I've drawn from different resources, is the French approach, the English retreat up a rise and put their baggage train behind them with their horses behind the baggage train. And the French watch them do it. And then the master stroke, the French attack from the rear. They burst through the baggage train. Meanwhile, they're capturing all of the English Breton horses and they're gonna take them away. This is gonna weaken this English Anglo-Breton force. So what do they do? They form a shield run, <coughs> using their lances, spears, anything they can as pikes to keep the cavalry away. So what I like about this, this small little battle here is the fact that the French are changing tactics or these French are changing tactics. Perhaps they've got the memory of what happened at the Battle of Cressy. Yeah, so they don't want to go a head-on charge into the English. But they've watched. They've taken out the horses. They've charged from the rear. So the English formed this shield front, as I say. Thank you, Scotland. I'm sure that's where they learnt it. The second division, charge. But they can't crack the shield front. The spears and lances, and there are bowmen amongst it as well. So they're charging around and around, just like some Hollywood film. You remember when you had the cowboys and Indians, that nonsense of the Indians running around just being targets. That appears to be what the French are doing. Meanwhile, the French 3rd Division are watching the whole thing. Not because they don't want to get involved. They're looking for a weakness. But this Chiltron is so tight, this English position, this Anglo-Breton, let's get it right, position is so tight that they simply can't crack it, and it costs them 300 dead, plus prisoners of war. And Jean de Lille is unhorsed and captured, and another Frenchman is captured, actually, by the name of Bocicot. He will come to provenance later on in one of my other films. He becomes the Marshal of France. He figures large at the Battle of Agincourt, but that's another story. What happens here is they fight on 
till it gets dark. And what becomes of our gallant band, they gather their prisoners, look after their wounded, but they've got to push and pull their own wagons. And they manage to get to a nearby fortified position safely. But that's not the end of the story. There's a little, I love this, a little twist at the end. Coke, the commander there, on his way back, sends a detachment to reconnoitre, to have a look at the large castle, Taylorburg. It controls a crossing over the river Charente. Well, that little patrol catch the French napping, completely surprise them. And by the end of June, that castle is in English hands. This is a disaster for the French. It causes them to abandon their siege of Lusignan. It's got lots of repercussions, but what this little battle shows is the French are learning. This Hundred Years' War, this war of the Breton succession, the French are changing. And then we have the next battle, the Battle of Moron. So the Battle of Moron, 14th of August, 1352, a French army invades Brittany. They have had some success. Now they're going for the castle of Plumel. This is garrisoned by Anglo-Breton, Breton soldiers and English soldiers. Now the French force, uh, 5,000 men. I've got to read these names because I'm trying to get them right. The overall commander, Guy II de Nestle. Uh, he was there, one of his commanders, Jean de Beaumanoir and Alain de Tintiniac. It's important I got those names in because these are knights from the Order of the Star and we're also at the Combat of the Thirty, another one of my films that uh, I've done on this subject. Now, Sir Walter Bentley commands the Anglo-Breton forces. got a, a Breton with him. Now, I've never said this name, Tanguy I du Chastel. I hope I got that right. So the French forces, 5,000 men. The Anglo force is 2,000. This is what happens. Now, when you look back at the film in the first part of this, where the French look and they try and outfox the English, this is the total reverse. The English fall back against the tree line. They form their wedges, their hearse, as some people call it, of bowmen, and then the men-at-arms in the centre. And what do the French do? They don't hang back, have a look, what can we do? They charge full on. The French charge in the old way. The previous battle we talked about, the French have reconnoitred the battlefield. They're looking for weak spots. But here, the English have been allowed to form up the bowmen on the flanks, the men-at-arms in the centre. Now, many of these knights on these horses were from the Order of the Star. This chivalric idea of charge! and don't surrender. On they come, and the bowmen decimate them. They shoot into the sides of the horses. Those poor beasts must have been in agony, charging all over the battlefield. Men are unhorsed. Straight away, the Anglo-Breton men-at-arms come forward and slaughter anybody who is standing. This is a nasty little fight. Now, excuse my pronunciation, but Jean de Beaumanoir is killed. Alain de Tintaniac is killed. And the commander himself, Guy de Nestle, he is killed. With 80 members, knights these are, of the Order of the Star. Many of the noble knights of Brittany are killed in this nasty, short, sharp, little known battle. The Battle of Moron. So, the final battle in our trilogy of fights from the Breton War of Succession. All right, 29th of September, 1364. It's getting on a bit there. So the French should be learning. And this is reflected in the battle. Now, the commanders are on the French side, Charles of Blois, Bertrand du Gesselin, and Count Auxerre. They command 4,000 men. And they look at the battle properly. And let's see what happens. You see, John de Montfort and Jean Chandos of the Anglo-Breton force have got 6,000 men. They outnumber the French. And so the French, 
they actually intercepted this Anglo-Breton force that were going to lay siege to the uh, castle nearby. Not wanting to be caught between the castle and the French, they come out and Jean Chandos, they form their troops as such. And what do the French do? They think about it at last. And they send their crossbowmen in. But there's not enough of them. And they are outclassed and outshot and sent to flight. So this is reflecting, isn't it? This is quite interesting how the French starting to look at the battle. How can we engage those longbowmen? How can we deal with them with their crossbowmen? And it failed. So the archery duel having failed, the main body now attack in three divisions. Obviously, I haven't got enough soldiers to do thousands of men. So we're just giving you three divisions going head on towards the English man at arms. Count Auxerre is on the right. Charles Blas Centre and uh, de Gesselin is on the left side. As they attack, the one thing the French haven't got, they've got no reserves. So it doesn't matter how hard they hit the English and the Breton forces, they've got reserves. So whenever a man falls, there's another one takes his place. And then the English actually bring their bowmen and their other men at arms around on the flank and collapse the right flank of the French in on itself. Then on the other side, the English with their bowmen and their Breton men do exactly the same and they hit the French. So the French army collapses in on itself. They're surrounded. They lose in excess of a thousand dead. The English and the Breton force there, it's unknown, but it said their losses were light. This is terrible because Charles de Blois was killed. Uh, Count Auxerre was killed. And uh, de Gessler was taken prisoner. It's a disaster. The French are soundly beaten. It is an Anglo-Breton victory. Yes, and it's the last battle of the Breton War of Succession. However, there's a twist in the tale. So, the twist in the tale. What a nasty little war this Breton War of Succession was. Sieges, towns, suffering, lots of killing. And at the end of it, the Anglo-Breton force is successful. They defeat the French-Breton force at the Battle of Oray. And that should be the end of the whole thing, except the King of France recognises John de Montford as the Duke of Brittany. And John de Montford then pays homage to the French king, abandoning his ally, Edward III of England. Ouch! The French lost the actual war, but they won the politics. Those crafty little devils, the French. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little film. Bit adventurous, eh? Three battles in one film. Yeah, if you did, please thumbs up like share and subscribe and don't forget to turn on the notification button so you know what's coming down the line but a special shout out now for my patreon members michael swatton stian husborn and peter bush thanks guys makes all the difference see you soon